Here we have um, the UCC 3-402 signature by representative. So when you sign as authorized representative of the all caps name under I, if the form of the signature shows unambiguously, that means very clearly, that the signature is made on behalf of the represented person who is identified in the instrument. You notice how sometimes under the line that the signature on it will be like um, so, so, so and so law firm and then the person above will be the attorney or it'll be the attorney's name in all caps. Well that's unambiguously, right? Because that's showing the signature is the all capital letter name that's listed below it. Or it could be Bank of America underneath the signature line and the signature on top would be who's representing Bank of America. So if you say, you know, as authorized representative, then that's unambiguously. The representative is not liable on the instrument. You have no liability if you sign as the authorized representative. Let's look at the criminal timeline here. The first thing that happens is the arrest or the ticket. And in the arrest, you go before the judge for a probable cause hearing and with the ticket you sign a promise to appear. If you sign the promise to appear you're giving jurisdiction up and, it con and you're entering into a contract. And then the next thing is you have time for administrative remedy. This is where you're sending in conditional acceptances or refused for cause. If you send the DA a conditional acceptance of the charges against you then if they don't prove the claim then you send a a default estoppel and you get everything file stamped and you have something to go to court. The next thing is get a copy of the docket showing who the players are and when the complaint was filed. These would be more in criminal not in traffic because traffic they don't have a docket that shows when everything is filed but in a criminal case you know a misdemeanor or a felony you'd get a copy of the docket that shows who the players are, who's the judge, who's the DA, and what was stated at the hearing and it'll show when the complaint was filed and you want to get a copy of the complaint. And then we go to a file is created and a, com and a complaint or ticket is filed. First hearing is the arraignment. At the arraignment, one, the purposes of the arraignment was one, to identify the defendant. I mean you have to stand up and say you're the defendant and if you don't do that then the court has a problem. Two, they have to read the charges because you have to, under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, the United States Constitution, you have to know the nature and charge and they consider reading uh, nature and cause. And they consider reading the charges giving you the nature and cause, but that's not actually true. Three, they have to decide on who will speak for the defendant. In other words, if you're going to get a lawyer, then the lawyer is going to speak for the defendant and if you're not going to get a lawyer, then you have to uh, sign something that authorizes you, the living soul, to speak on behalf of the defendant and you're not the defendant. Four, ask for a plea to the charges. The judge is going to ask for a plea. Now in order to plea you have to know, you have to have a legitimate charging instrument and you have to have uh, injured somebody. And so uh, under the penal code they can plea f if, they can plea for the defendant if the defendant refuses to enter a plea. So you're going to bring a script to court and read off the script and it's like a chess game. There's four things they're going to have to do and you're going to know that they're going to have to do them so you're going to get ready for them and challenge them on that. You can also bring your conditional acceptance and uh, challenge the fact that they have a lawful case. And the last thing we're going to look at is writing motions in the statutory world so you can write a motion to dismiss due to invalid charging instrument or no injured party or a number of other reasons, a mis misnomer which is the wrong name, lack of subject matter and personam jurisdiction, a motion to disqualify the judge, the DA, etc. And then you can, in the common law, you can write writs like a writ of error, a writ of quo warranto, which challenges uh, their authority, and a writ of prohibition, which means that um, unless they can prove that they have jurisdiction, you're going to remove the case to a higher court. And since they don't actually have a higher court high enough to hear your case, I guess that'll just mean that it goes in limbo. And here we are with the civil timeline in case you're in a civil trial. 
First, you got a, a summons that the suit is filed and the date for a hearing is set. And you're going to, after you get the summons, you're going to go to the clerk of the civil court and get a copy of the complaint. Because if you don't know what the complaint is, then there's no way you can uh, put a motion to dismiss or, a, or an answer to the complaint. The next thing that is going to happen is, is that you're going to have a chance to do administrative remedy. It should have been done prior to this because, you know, if you're going to have a civil complaint, complaint against you. A civil complaint is a complaint for money. So the credit card company is asking you for money or you're in a foreclosure situation or somebody is asking you for money. And so administrative remedy would be, you know, accepting the fact that you owe money based upon proof of claim that they have suffered a loss and that they actually lent you any money. So your administrative remedy should have been done prior to this point, but if it hasn't, you can start it at this point because usually a court case is going to take longer than 30 days to complete, and 30 days is enough time to get an administrative remedy completed. And then you're going to file a motion to dismiss or an answer using your administrative remedy or a motion to strike or something, some way of, of not having to answer this or filing an answer. If you don't file a motion to dismiss or a motion to strike or an answer within the 30 days or in some cases within five days, in an unlawful detainer case it's only five days, if you don't file the answer it's a default judgment and you lose. It's just a summary proceeding after you go to court and the judge will say you're guilty and you owe the money because you didn't file an answer or you didn't file a motion to dismiss. And, you know, you're, you're going to use your administrative remedy if it's done, or you're going to cite that there's no standing to sue on their part, or file a, in a common law, or file a writ of quo warranto, or a writ of prohibition for lack of jurisdiction. And then you're going to go to the last, or the next phase would be um, after you've uh, you're engaging and you're saying that uh, you don't believe that you're liable, you're going to issue a subpoena to, say, the CFO of the bank or to someone else to testify and bring the original wet ink signed contracts and accounting documents. Affidavits of a loss, send a demand to see the attorney's license to practice law, a power of attorney to represent the bank, show attorney's bonds or insurance policies, and a demand for discovery. And in this demand for discovery, they're going to have to show you what they have, what they're going to use in court against you. And everything they send you, they can use, but anything they don't send you, they can't use. A subpoena, a deposition from the bank asking for proof of loss, possession of the original contract, etc. They can't enter any hearsay evidence. So, in other words, somebody has to testify that he knows that you have injured them and that they have suffered a loss. And you'll be surprised how many uh, people are unwilling to make statements of that sort because once you prove that they're lying, they can go to jail for that. And then the other thing you can do is file a counterclaim for lack of jurisdiction and fraud, denying your right to liberty as you now have to defend a malicious prosecution. Okay, here we have a motion to dismiss, and up in the left corner we have the uh, party who's sending it, John Doe, and their address, and their, um, their position is authorized representative and pro per, or you could be private attorney. And then the court, this is the caption area, the court it's in, and then here we have what it is. It's a motion to dismiss with the exhibits uh, JD1 through JD5. And then we go down to the motion to dismiss, and we go, we start off, comes now John Doe, sui juris, one of the people of California in this court of record to motion the, the court to dismiss the matter and then you name the matter number or the case number for failure to state a case upon which relief can be granted. And then under the footnotes, under the people in one, the footnote down here says, at the revolution the sovereignty evolved on the people and they are truly the sovereigns of the country, but they are sovereigns without subjects, with none to govern but themselves. And then sovereignty itself is, of course, not subject to law, for it is the author and source of law. But in our system, while sovereign powers are delegated to the agencies of government, sovereignty itself remains with the people. 
So what I've done there is I'm saying I'm one of the people, I'm sovereign. And then in this court of record, and there's a footnote too, a court of record is a judicial tribunal having attributes and exercising functions independently of the person of the magistrate designated generally to hold it and proceeding according to the course of common law, its acts and proceedings being enrolled for perpetual memorial. So then we go over to um, the next page where we're going to list out the facts. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to state the facts and we're, that are going to support our claim. One, on or about May 30th, 2009, I, John Doe, was served with a summons to appear in Superior Court of California County of Alameda to answer to the complaint in matter number. So I've, I've described what, what, what happened there. That's true, so that's unlikely they're going to lie about that. They're going to admit it. <clears throat> Although they wouldn't know whether you were served with a summons or not. Two, this, the complaint contains no facts supporting a claim of injury or loss. Oftentimes, their, their claim against you doesn't actually include any facts. What would, what would a fact be supporting the claim? How about a copy of the original contract and then the fact, you know, the statements showing that you didn't make the payments, which would be, at least be some facts, but they don't even include those generally. You know, in an unlawful detainer, they never show the fact that they actually paid the bank and got, a, you know, they, they don't show the canceled check. So where's the evidence that they purchased the property? All they have is a piece of paper from their county recorder's office showing that they're the new owner. That doesn't prove anything. Uh, three, the complaint does not show the plaintiff suffered an injury uh, or loss under the required element of standing. And then footnote three, standing. The requirement of standing, however, has a co core constant component derived directly from the Constitution. A plaintiff must allege personal injury fairly traceable to the defendant's allegedly unlawful conduct and likely to be redressed by the requested relief. Standing has a core constitutional component that a plaintiff must allege personal injury fairly traceable to the conduct. There has to be a personal injury or a, or a loss. And Doe is challenging jurisdiction in this motion to dismiss, and no jurisdiction has been shown to exist by the plaintiff. I, I'm putting that in as a fact because it's true. I am challenging jurisdiction. Five, Doe sent the CFO, care of Capital One Bank, South Dakota, a debt validation letter dated February 16th. This is the administrative remedy that had been done prior and received by UPS certified mail number on February 22nd. So I have evidence that through a certified mail that, that they received the debt validation letter and I sent it to the CFO. I, don't, I didn't know the name of the CFO, so I just said CFO, care of. Six, Doe did not receive any rebuttal to his debt validation letter dated February 16th, 2009. And then I have a footnote four. And then at footnote four it says C exhibit down at the bottom here, it would say C Exhibit JD2, which would be my um, notice of default. Seven, Doe sent a notice of default estoppel to Capital One Bank. And then we go down to two, Law of the Case. Now this is where I'm going to declare the Law of the Case. And it states, I, John Doe, decree the law of the case as follows. Now, the sovereign decrees the laws, so since I've stated that I'm one of the people and I'm sovereign, I'm decreeing the law of the case. One, all case law and codes, etc., noted in the footnotes. These are going to be the law of the case. Anything that I put in the footnotes to support my case is going to be law of the case. Two, to claim a debt, a party has to have a lawful debt owed to it, evidenced by a lawful contract. And footnote six, debt, a sum of money due by certain and expressed agreement. And this is out of Black's Law Fourth, down here. And then the definition of money in Black's Law Fourth. It is usual and ordinary acceptation. It means gold, silver, or paper money used as a circulating medium of exchange and does not embrace notes, bonds, evidences of debt, or other personal or real estate. So money means gold or silver or paper money that represents gold and silver that can be exchanged for gold and silver, but not uh, notes. Now your Federal Reserve note is a note. 
So then we go back up to three. The elements of a lawful contract are the meeting of the minds. Uh, valid lawful consideration must be exchanged. C, two or more wedding signatures under full commercial liability. So I'm stating that these things are the law of the case. I'm claiming that in order for a contract to be valid and lawful, it has to have these things. But it's not just me that's claiming them because I'm citing uh, references. Set four, the plaintiff mu suing must prove jurisdiction by demonstrating standing. Five, money is not credit. Six, all items mentioned in California Evidence Code sections 451 and 452, among which is included the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And then I go to two, conclusions of law. The plaintiff, Capital One, N.A., South Dakota, has filed a frivolous suit without merit, without facts supporting a claim of injury or loss, and does, does so after being lawfully stopped from making any claims against the defendant. That's our administrative remedy. One can only conclude that the plaintiff moves forward committing a fraud upon the court. Capital One has made the claim that the defendant received money from them, yet under the legal definition of money they are not shown any factual they have not shown any factual or verified evidence, in other words, a sworn affidavit, of any lawful consideration was given to the defendant. In conclusion, the plaintiff and its attorneys, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, have not presented a claim upon which relief can be granted. I, John Doe, pray the just and honorable court dismiss this matter, and then I name the case number, and award me damages as the court deems proper. And then I sign it without prejudice by colon, and then the signature as authorized representative of John Doe slash pro per. And that's a motion to dismiss, simple. And here we have a, um, another um, court paper, paperwork writing to enter. And this is a disqualification of judge, disqualification of DA for cause, comma, disqualification of DA for cause, per CCP 170.1, which is a code of civil procedure and the California Constitution and government codes, verified, and then the exhibits. So, disqualification of judge for cause. I, John Henry Doe, sui juris, one of the people of California in this court of record, do decree Judge Virginia Danner is disqualified to act as a judicial officer, magistrate, for the following. One, for failing to meet the California constitutional requirements of having a lawful oath of office filed within the time allotted and having vacated her office. Two, now I got a copy of her oath and it doesn't comply with the uh, Title 20, Section 3 of the California Constitution, which I include, and it shows uh, the, off, the, um, the, the codes that uh, mean that, show that she's vacated her office by failing to file within the 30 days. Two, for failing to present a valid bond as required by the various government codes and codes of civil procedure. and three, for not being an elected judge, per CCP 170.1. In the Constitution, if you don't consent to being heard by a judge that hasn't been elected, you can disqualify them for cause. And I do not stipulate to representing myself a living soul before any judicial officer who has not been elected. Four, for having a financial interest in the defendant. Five, for not providing a certified copy of Danner's required bond per government code. Six, Danner has showed her lack of impartiality by representing the prosecutor in a hearing on June 30th, 2010, when John Henry Doe was requested to cease acting as counsel for Jane Doe unless he could prove he had a California state issued license to practice law per Danner. John Henry Doe demanded that Andrew Luss, Deputy DA, produce his state license to remove him or remove himself from court per Danner's requirement, to which Danner stated no, which is an expressed intention to legally represent the prosecutor. So in, in which case, if the judge is going to represent the prosecution, that's a conflict of interest. For, seven, for failing to timely answer the writ of quo rento, and on and on. So you see, you can enter a disqualification of the judge or the DA, and that, that would be one way to do it.
And here is how to do a simple um, conditional acceptance. You would take the presentment, which is a demand for payment, and in this case it's from the uh, Franchise Tax Board of the State of California. And this is a demand for payment, court-ordered debt collections. And I simply took a red pen and wrote on top of it, I, John Doe, conditionally accept this presentment based upon proof of claim that I am liable. Failure to show proof of claim within 10 calendar days after receiving this will stipulate to abandonment of claim. And then I signed it without prejudice by colon my signature as authorized representative of the all cap letter name who it was addressed to and dated it. And if I send this off proof of service certified mail and they don't respond within 10 days and I don't receive a response with, with, with them from 10 days then I'm going to send a notice of estoppel against them. Default. You defaulted and you abandoned the claim. Thank you very much. What, what, the other thing that you should do in this case would be you look up who are the um, people in charge of the Franchise Tax Board. So John Chang and Betty Yi and so and so. You would send it to one of them personally. To John Chang, care of the Franchise Tax Board. 